Thank you very much. Let's get this show on the road. I'm going to start completely differently today uh, with a statement that I normally throw about the dinner table, and that is, don't believe a word I say. I want you to take this in, absorb it, think about it, and go away and reach your own conclusions. I'm going to present you with a bunch of facts and some interesting discoveries and some theories and conclusions, but these are my theories and conclusions based on some scientific evaluations. That doesn't mean that everybody will agree, but after statistical evaluation and probabilities thrown about, I tend to sway towards my conclusions rather than any other conclusions. So um, until somebody else presents me with something more overwhelming, I'll stick to this, and I hope that you'll take something away from this that'll make you think at least. So to start off with, um, the history of our planet is not as it seems. This is a very important and crucial little bit of information that we need to sink into our subconscious. Because when we come out of school, and for those that are priv privileged enough to go to university, it's often associated with ego. And you know, you think that oh, I'm a well-educated guy, no one's gonna lie to me or pull the wool over, over my eyes. Well, surprise, surprise. The higher your education, the more liable or the more probable you are for having the wool pulled over your eyes. And I am one of those perfect examples. It's taken me a lifetime to figure this out, and uh, hopefully we can uh, shortcut this process for a lot of people. Things are not as they seem. There's been a lot of stuff happening on this planet that makes no sense. And when you start delving and researching origins of humankind and asking those questions, who are we, where do we come from, and why are we here? I bet you that every one of you has asked those questions before, and not just you here, but millions of people around the world, not just once, but many times. And here we are, still not sure. Who are we, where do we come from, and why are we here? What I call the great human puzzle. But I think the incredible revelations that the Southern African continent is delivering to us now at this very special time in human history approaching 2012 and other interesting time periods, it is very important to take these things into consideration. These things do not happen by coincidence. And uh, the more I research, the more I realize that this is probably so. So when you start going back and researching human history and looking at the anomalies that don't make any sense, you realize very quickly that you can't just stick to history or archaeology or, or uh, whatever it is, or geology. You've got to actually open your mind and, and learn and research everything that crosses your desk. Because if you don't, you will miss pieces of the puzzle. And a lot of the very important pieces of the puzzle come from indigenous knowledge, ancient indigenous knowledge that in the Western society especially is ignored and buried and forgotten. And that is a great shame. And it is from that in, uh, ancient indigenous knowledge that a lot of wisdom comes. And you'll see how this ties beautifully into some very advanced modern scientific discoveries. The other fascinating thing is that you realize that all these areas of research, whether it's astronomy, archaeology, physics, mathematics, quantum physics, metaphysics, paranormal activity, you realize that all these areas start to cross over very, very quickly, and that you cannot separate anything from anything else, that there's some sort of a common denominator that holds them all together, some sort of a weird energy field that holds all this information together. And that becomes very exciting. When that happens to any researcher, it is a life-changing experience, and it certainly was for me. And at that moment, you realize that everything is related. And that is a beautiful moment to reach in your life as a researcher with a, an inquiring mind. To remind you, that is our little planet that we live on. Sometimes we forget to look at it from a distance. And it's just a beautiful example of sacred geometry hovering in the midst of space perfectly relating to everything around it in absolute balance and harmony. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be there. To support that the history of our planet is not as it seems, that some really strange things have been going on for a long time, is a wonderful photograph at a, the giant footprint near the Swaziland border, near a place called Mpaluzi. Um, now, you've got two choices as a 
researcher, archaeologist, or a scholar. You can either reject it as some hoax, or you can take it seriously and realize that this is the real article, this is the real thing. And the moment you do that, and you speak to geologists, uh, when geologists see this, it sends shivers up their spine, because it tells them immediately, if they remember what they were taught at school, that you know, this footprint is somewhere between 200 million and, and um, 3 billion years old. And that immediately tells you that something else has been going on this planet for a hell of a long time. And we're only starting to scratch the surface of this body of knowledge. <clears throat> so if history is written by the victors, how much do we really know about our human history? This is a fascinating subject because we get thrown these kind of idioms every day, you know, and we just swallow them and regurgitate them. Oh, history is written by the victors. Oh, of course, of course. But what does it actually mean? Well, it actually means a great deal. You've got to analyze these little statements and think about them. Because if you speak to statisticians, they'll tell you that if you take that statement for, at face value, it means that you lose at least 50% of information dur during any major conflict situation, right? Okay, that presents a huge problem for those that write our history books and for the stuff that we read in history books and we trust and value as being accurate and true. Well, I'm going to show you that what we know about human history is so far removed from what happened it, that we actually cannot trust and believe anything, and we have to evaluate and reevaluate everything all the time. So, let's to first find the start of this little departure is we need to go back to the first so called civilization on Earth. By the end of tonight, you'll realize that this, the Sumerians were supposed to be the first civilization on Earth, right? So, they emerged sometimes uh, around 6,000 years ago in the, in, in the Mesopotamian area. And they gave us all the knowledge we have today. We read in history books that we should be grateful to the Sumerians for our knowledge of architecture, archaeology, medicine, music, even you know, recipes and cooking and, and all the technical stuff that we use today, we pretty much inherited from the Sumerians. So if they were the first civilization on earth and they started 6,000 years ago, uh, just to, you know, among you, throw out a number. How many wars have we had in 6,000 years? See, uh, smart man. Uh, average, let's average it out at one war a year. So 6,000 wars in 6,000 years. Let's put this into our statistical model and see what it spits out, okay? And that's what you have. You start 6,000 years ago with year one with 100% of knowledge and information. And year two, we only know 50% of that original knowledge I'm not saying it's the absolute truth, but it's the closest to the truth, right? We've decided on that already. By the time you get to uh, year number eight, we already know less than 1% of the original truth. And then the horror of horrors, when you get down 124 years into civilization, that's all you've got to do. 124 years into civilization, 6,000 years ago, this is how much we know, that long number down there. And that's why I stop. I stop there because it's a very significant number. It's 10 to the minus 34. Uh, which is often referred to as Planck's constant. Now, that suggests that after that, anything else is really highly insignificant. And by the time we go 124 years into origins of humankind and human civilization, we know less about our human origins than is permissible by the laws of physics. So that's a thing I'd like you to put in the back of your mind and remember, because it's an important thing. So next time somebody starts to tell you about what Napoleon did here or what happened there and what the Toltecs did and so forth, just say, okay, we know less than we know than is allowable by the laws of physics about our human history, so let's think carefully about what we read in history books. We live in an electromagnetic universe. That's another very important thing. And if you think I'm going uh, you know, about ancient African civilizations in a weird way, very, very soon you'll see where this, where this all leads to. It's important to lay this foundation. Otherwise, by the end of tomorrow, when I really spring the big wow on you, you're going to go, this guy's nuts. And, uh, you know, I don't want that to happen, obviously. So everything spins and vibrates. And that is the reality of our electromagnetic universe. And... Because it spins and vibrates, we can detect it, and we know it's present, because everything has a frequency, from subatomic particles to planets and solar systems that have these atomic-like structures and 
things rotating around other things. And then you see, especially when you move further away from that, and you start looking at galaxies, you start seeing this spinning and vibrating effect really beautifully, these vortices that are scattered all over the universe. And then even the entire universe seems to have this spin motion, and uh, leading uh, physicists like Nassim Haramein point out very beautifully how this all fits together, and how this en energetic fields, these torus effects take place, and how they generate the energy, and how they regenerate this um, twisting vortex motion energy. So everything spins and vibrates, and because of that, we can detect it. And this is what the electromagnetic universe gets presented to us with very long waves on the left, and then the waves get higher and higher, and the frequencies get higher and higher until you get on this side. This is a continuum. It doesn't stop. It's infinite that way, and it's infinite this way, right? And everything, every specific thing, every tiny atom, molecule, cell, organelle, anything you can imagine vibrates at its own specific frequency. And once you know at which frequency it vibrates, you can affect it either positively or negatively, understanding the vibrational fields. The interesting thing is that out of this entire electromagnetic spectrum, we can only see with our eyes this sliver of light, which we call visible light over there. That's it. Everything else to the left and to the right of that, as far as we're concerned, is invisible. And I love this because the macho guys always come out and say, well, you know, if I can't see it and I can't touch it, show me physical proof. I want physical evidence. Then I'll believe it. Well, unfortunately, there is not always physical evidence for the stuff of the universe. And we have to look at other areas for evidence. So <clears throat> my answer to that is if, if you want physical proof and if you can't touch it and you can't see it, it doesn't exist, then obviously you must be a really big... And hopefully they get the message that you don't always have to see it to believe it. I'm glad I made my point. <laughs> Sometimes it's dead silence. <laughs> okay, maybe my timing wasn't that good. <laughs> okay, so... Where does this take us with ancient civilizations? How did they respond to all the stuff on the left and the stuff on the right? And uh, we realized that they had a very, very keen understanding of this. And they called it the third eye, the pineal gland, which they had a very keen understanding. And you'll see the third eye notion echoing through all ancient cultures, or pretty much all ancient cultures. And somehow they knew a lot more about this psychic ability or the ESP of being able to feel and read and understand the other frequencies that are not necessarily visible with our eyes, not the visible light, but all the other stuff. And that's pretty much what the pineal gland is. There's been huge amounts of study done on that. I suggest you go away and have a look at that. It is really amazing once you discover how important the pineal gland is in our anatomy and how that has been manipulated to control us. It becomes quite spectacular. So basically what the pineal gland is is a frequency receptor. Right? Just like our eyes are frequency receptors, they pick up the frequency of the visible light and, and convert it into something that our brains understand. The same thing with the pineal gland, except it's embedded in the middle of your head. You don't need a lens. It just picks up all the other frequencies and converts them into you know, understandable information. Well, that no longer seems to be the case. But we, there seem to be some people that are awakening and are regaining the ability to use their pineal gland. What does this all have to do with ancient civilizations and stone ruins in southern Africa? Everything. You'll see that these ancient civilizations understood frequency and they understood energy and how to convert frequency into energy. And that is actually amazing. Even, even the, the simple formula that Max Planck uses, that frequency equals energy, starts to come home and it becomes interesting how ancient civilizations and modern physics overlap very, very comfortably. Sound and frequency are the common denominators of pretty much all religions and all creations. And very quickly you realize that in the beginning there was the Word. The Bible tells us that God said, let there be light. The Word of God. It is the sound of God that created the universe and all things in it. 
And in Hinduism and in Eastern philosophy, it's the primordial sound, the om or the aum that created all things. And very quickly, do you not only realize that sound seems to be the primordial source of all things in the universe, but very quickly you reconcile Eastern and Western philosophy that gave birth to all these religions and also understand and lay the foundations for this thing called Laws of nature, sometimes referred to as sacred geometry. And boy, when you say sacred geometry, some people go running for the hills because it's got the word sacred in it, right? And it's some wishy-washy religious thing. No, we can't get in that, get involved in that. We don't understand sacred. I don't know what that means. Well, sacred actually is a Greek word that means fixed. So we're dealing not with some wishy-washy religious principle, but we're dealing with fixed geometry as it's fixed by the divine creator, the primordial source of all things. And suddenly, everything changes, and we realize that there's only one law of nature, one, uh, only one law, and that is the law of nature. The six aspects of Om in Eastern philosophy, six sound frequencies, Omani Padme Hum, for those of you that do chanting. And suddenly, in the symbol of Hinduism, you start seeing, and many of these other symbols, you start seeing these beautiful shapes that are actually the representations of sound manifesting itself in physical form. And this is a beautiful moment. Uh, this goes back to the 1700s with the Kladni plates, and then Hans Jenny's research in the 70s, 60s and 70s. They've been fantastic. Go away and have a look at that. You'll see the most phenomenal things come to life. And then you realize that these six aspects of Om are perfectly represented in sacred geometry or in the biblical tale of the six days of creation. There you go. Six circles around one, and on the seventh day, God rested. And you realize that we're combining all the stuff into the laws of nature that starts to show us the source and the origin of these things, and it all seems to come from sound. And it's interesting to see that the six, number six thing is not uh, just restricted to, you know, Christianity or Hinduism and so forth, but even Egyptian religion talks about... Um, talks about the six aspects of the eye, eye of Horus, or the eye of Ra. And then you realize that um, the five basic platonic shapes, the five primary frequencies, the five, five, five primary shapes that seem to give rise to all other matter and all the frequencies are all inextricably linked to the six days of creation. First there was the void, and then, uh, then you see the, the five following days of creation. And you see how all this starts to fit together. Um, as the, 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 the essence of God moved across the waters and across the void and so forth. And there you go. They're the six aspects of the eye of Ra. So it's, it's not just restricted to Western and Eastern philosophies, but also Egyptian philosophy and way beyond. You start seeing it uh, popping up in, in other ancient civilizations as well. And we're actually seeing the number six when you start... Uh, when, when you finally get exposed to the wonderful work of Willem de Swart in The Secret Numbers of God, you'll understand that this number six is very important because it actually represents the physical world and the representation of the, the, the manifested and the imaginary uh, world that we perceive around ourselves, this thing called the nature of reality. Um, vibration frequencies, harmonics, resonance, that is the stuff that makes up the universe and everything in it. Why are some numbers so significant? Well, sound seems to be primordial seed. We've discovered that, discussed that already. And you realize that, see, these, these ancient civilizations used all these numbers. And they didn't just throw these numbers out, you know, like have a board meeting and say, well, let's use number three all the time. It'll really cr confuse the crap out of future generations. Yeah. And number seven is a cool number. We'll use seven as well. And then, uh, hey, 12's good. And then what about 22? Okay, let's use these numbers and see what happens. <clears throat> these guys knew exactly what they were doing. They understood the laws of nature and they applied it to everything they did. And that's the phenomenon that we find when we start analyzing the structures and the monuments in Egypt and everywhere else on earth. And that does not exclude South African um, ruins and, and the, the ancient civilizations of South Africa. In fact, they become highly visible in that. And the number three is the Holy Trinity. And it, it can be represented in so many different ways, right? Um, the, the way that you can explain it in music and in frequency is Three notes make up a harmonious chord, right? The first note is just your note, your reference point. Your second code is your, 
as your reference point, your starter, starter note, your reference point, and only when you play the third note and complete the Holy Trinity, you complete the trichord, and you complete the harmonic chord, and then you can manipulate that chord, and you can, you know, make it a flattened third or augmented seventh, and, and you can manipulate people's emotions. Look what soundtracks do to people. They make you weep in a movie. It's not the visuals. It's the soundtrack that makes you weep. It's the sound that harmonizes and vibrates with your soul and with your heart that makes, that moves you. It's not the visuals. Number seven and eight. What has number seven and eight got to do? Well, there's seven whole notes in one harmonic resonant octave. The eighth note is the end of that octave and the common boundary between the one and the next octave. So it binds them together. And in that notion, you realize that that's how all these vibrational harmonic frequencies and these bubbles of the universe are linked together by the common boundaries of the harmonic resonant frequencies. The number 12 and 13 does the same. When you take 12 spheres, you place them perfectly around 13 spheres so that they all touch. 12 disciples around Christ. You see the symbology coming out of that, and you realize it all comes back to the laws of nature, not to the laws of science or mathematics, the laws of nature, sacred geometry. And 12... Uh, 12 notes in one harmonic resonant octave, that's the seven whole notes and the five semitones, right, the black notes, together they 12. And the 13th note is the boundary of that, res that, that uh, harmonic octave and the common boundary between the next one. And then you suddenly see this number 22 appear everywhere. 22, you start seeing everywhere the moment you start researching it, and you realize that you know, how dumb can we be? 22 is one of the cosmic numbers because 22 over 7 is pi. And that is the common denominator between all circles and all spheres. No matter whether they're this big or the size of the universe, their common denominator number is 22 over 7. And they all share that number. And that is their ratio by which they are linked. And when you get deeper into this ratio thing, you realize that that is the fundamental thing that we need to pay attention to to understand what ancient civilizations were getting up to. It gets really, really exciting. The, more, the deeper you get into this sacred geometry, wishy-washy religious stuff, right? <clears throat> now, pioneers of sound. There have been a number of people in the last hundred years that understood this and embraced this and used sound and frequency to do all kinds of amazing things. But unfortunately, these people have been removed from the mainstream of, of uh, society because their information was highly dangerous to the mainstream of society, right? Uh, Royal Raymond Rife in 1931 was uh, quoted to be the man that found the cure for all disease. He also discovered the, or manufactured those first amazing microscopes that could see viruses and bacteria and living cells for the first time, that they could actually look at them. Uh, obviously, I didn't like that. When, when he found the cure for all disease, you can imagine what the pharmaceutical companies did to him. I said, you did what? You found the cure for all what? I don't think so, buddy. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, he didn't get very far with his cure for all disease. And what did he use? Frequency. Sound frequencies and other forms of frequency. There's still a huge debate about exactly what kind of frequencies he used, but um, there seems to be some information that he used about 750 different frequencies to cure cancer and all kinds of other diseases, everything you can probably imagine. And then uh, recently I found a guy in South Africa by the name of Paul Gravenstein. He gave me permission to talk about him and talk about his work. Well, he is the new modern day Royal Raymond Reif. He cures all disease and everything you can imagine in the field with the farmers, pests, insects, worms, viruses, you name it. And Paul lives, he's a very simple, humble farmer who's just got this gift and he knows exactly what to do. And uh, the one thing he told me is that he uses more than 50,000 frequencies to cure all these diseases. And he's got the ability to identify frequencies of anything you can imagine. Um, and uh, in my longer lectures, I speak in great, greater detail about how he works and what he does. But take a note of Paul because... Um, we need to make sure that we um, build some sort of protective energetic field around him before they um, wake up to his abilities. In 1888, John Keeley showed the world how the power of sound can be used to do all kinds of things. Lift giant blocks of stone, crush them into the finest kind of talcum powder, drill perfect holes with absolute precision and accuracy down to a fraction of a millimeter, um, he disassociated water with sound, uh, and he did all kinds of amazing things. And he also said that the earth rings like a bell. 
And this dinosphere that he had, this musical dinosphere, was directly associated with the frequencies of the earth. And uh, through the frequencies of the earth, you could tap into those and use them for a source of energy. And guess what? Um, this is exactly what Nikola Tesla said a couple of decades later when he built his Tesla tower. And Tesla obviously gave us free energy. Um, I, I heard from Andrew Collins the other day that um, one of his tests, um, he apparently lit about 20,000 homes in an experiment at one night um, in, on Long Island. 20,000 homes that he lit with his um, radiant energy from the tower on Long Island, his, his Tesla tower. But he also said that the earth rings like a bell, and wherever you are on the surface of planet earth, you can tap into that sound frequency and use it as an inexhaustible source of energy. Okay, these are all important clues, as you can see. We keep coming back to sound, right? And uh, there's the Tesla Tower on Long Island, built 1902, uh, and then brought down in 1917. And um, one of the things that I believe he did, based on the work of Carmen Bolter, there are two possibilities. He either drew the, the charge and the current, or the, the energy fields, let's call it that rather, from the ionosphere, because he speaks a lot about the ionosphere in his research, or he tapped into the surface of the earth, which Carmen Bolter from Calgary University suggests, and he tapped into the sound frequencies of planet earth, and he used that, and then he pulled it up to the top, and there he converted it into his radiant energy form. So one of the things is, that he did is also he created this, this light on the right-hand side, the cordless light. You pick up in your hand, and it, and it lights up. You don't need any wires. You don't need any power source. It just picks up the energy from your body and it lights up in your hand. Now you think it's magic. It's well documented. He showed this off many times. And guess what? We can do that today. There's a company right here in Johannesburg called High Pressure Heating uh, that does that. They do that with neon light tubes. They're in the heating, they're in the drying, wood drying business. And they got these long machines that they slide these tree trunks into. They tighten it up, suck all the oxygen out, suck all the air out, and they expose it to 13.56 megahertz. The way they test whether their machine is calibrated correctly and if it's going to work is by taking a tube of neon light and they stand above the machine and if the light lights up in their hand, they know that their machine is calibrated correctly and that it will work. So it's not magic. We can do it today, but we just don't apply it in our society. When I called them up and I said, well, why don't you use it in the factory and you know, offer it as a service, you know, cordless, you know, wireless lighting? They said to me, why? We're in the wood drying business. <laughs> Those are the boxes we put ourselves in. What does this all have to do with ancient ruins and civilizations, you might ask once again? Well, it seems to me from my research, what I'll share with you during the course of this weekend, is that Tesla, Keeley, and all these others just rediscovered what ancient civilizations knew very, very well a long, long time ago here in Southern Africa. They understood frequency, they understood energy, and how to put that to use in all possible ways. Everything is just frequency, including your thoughts, so be careful what you think. You've all seen the secret or heard about the secret and all that kind of stuff. It's real stuff. It's not wishy-washy science. It's real break, you know, breakthrough, groundbreaking scientific research. It shows us how our thoughts can do things and manifest our own reality. It gets really freaky when you get to that kind of level of research. And then that's why, you know, they call them mad scientists because, you know, how do you take what you see in the lab and what you study and you try and share that with the people on the street? They're going to think you're goofy, you know, no matter how you try and put it. And I must remind you that, you know, many people, are, you know, not common folk out, you know, in the world think that science has got it all figured out. It's not true. Science has got nothing figured out. If you speak to any scientist worth their salt, they'll tell you right off the bat, 90 to 95 percent of science is unexplained. We don't understand it. We observe it, but we don't understand it. And just because we can observe it doesn't mean we know what the hell is going on. So next time somebody tells you, oh, they got it all figured out, they don't. And I've got it you know, from some very senior scientists uh, in South Africa specifically that told me exactly what they observe in their laboratory. And that, the other thing that shocked me is that when um, this was a professor at, at the University of, of Port Elizabeth that told me 
that 90% or more of the stuff they observe in their lab, they don't, they don't understand. And I said, well, can I come and sit in your lab and, and make notes of the stuff you don't understand? And he said, no, we can't, we're not allowed to note, note it or report on it until we understand it. That's a big pity. The ancients were primitive. This is how ancient civilizations are shown to us. And uh, this is what we believe they did. Uh, I better speed up here by the looks of things. And it's these ancient primitive guys that did stuff like this, right? Because they were bored. And, and then we get told, if you watch History Channel, apparently they built this because they needed to know where the sun came up. That's what they tell us on History Channel. Um, I can think of many ways, much easier ways to figure out, you know, uh, stick a few sticks in the ground and figure out where the sun comes up. And then when they were bored with building circles like this, they, they built big statues like this. And apparently also this one tells us where east is, so it was probably obviously built to face east, so we know where east was just in case they forgot. And when they were tired of building statues, they built stuff like this, platforms, giant platforms out of big stone. We don't know why they needed platforms in those days, but they built them in any case, just in case they had to find a use for a platform at some stage. Let's build a platform, come on, we've got nothing better to do. You know, cruising around the felt, avoiding snakes. Hey, let's build a platform. <laughs> That's what our history books tend to suggest. And then they got into stuff like this. And this is really when, when you watch the poor guys in Discovery Channel trying to imitate how they built this, you just realize how pathetic it is. We don't know how they, how they did this. We got no bloody idea until you start embracing the thought or the concept of frequency manipulation and sound manipulation. Suddenly, this all becomes an absolute reality, and you realize we're dealing with something very special and very unique. And then they obviously built stuff like this. Um, well, Carmen Bolter, as I mentioned earlier, her wonderful documentary, uh, Pyramid Code, um, she shows in there that the pyramids are nothing else but the generation for the generation of energy, and she shows you beautifully that these were giant energy devices. And if you think that after years and years of abuse, of being gutted and, and destroyed, they have lost their energy fields, <clears throat> you'd be mistaken. Here's an amazing photograph taken with a special lens that shows you that there's still some weird electromagnetic fields that come out of there. Incidentally, we will be doing this kind of photography with special lenses at Adam's calendar and some of the many stone circles in Waterfallburfen very shortly. Um, so something strange is still going on, and I'll be talking more in great detail about these energies and frequencies tomorrow. Mythology. Um, the word mythology um, is completely misused and misunderstand, misunderstood in today's society. The original word mythos comes from Greek once again, and it did not mean imaginary, fairy tale, or anything of that nature. It actually meant words, written words, stories and legends, historic events that were sworn to be accurate and true by priests and kings. So it was an affidavit or an affidavit of an accurate account in history. So it actually means completely the opposite to the value that we ascribe to it today. So from now on, every time you read the word mythology, you gotta ascribe the correct value to it and just re replace it with the word history, not imaginary. And suddenly our entire human history changes dramatically. Suddenly there are all these gods coming down from the sky, doing all these wonderful things with flying machines and could do all kinds of things. And you start realizing the difference between gods with a small g and God with a big G. And very quickly, the two start to separate and the twain shall never meet. For decades, scholars have been talking about um, the origins of humankind at the tip of Southern Africa. I'm gonna speed up here because I'm gonna run out of time. Um, where is the cradle of humankind? Well, it started a few decades ago and it was somewhere up there. And then it moved further down there and then it came down there and then it came down there. And then it was down here somewhere and then just recently, even in the last week, there's brand new genetic, um, genetic uh, information that was put out um, that the cradle of humankind is none other, nowhere else than right in the south of Africa. Southern Africa is where the cradle of humankind is. And the widest genetic diversity comes from Southern Africa and therefore there can be no question that the origins of humankind kind comes from Southern Africa and nowhere else. And this is very important to support the, found, the findings that we're making in the, the ancient ruins and civilizations here. 
Mitochondrial Eve studies have been suggesting this over and over again, talking about, you know, 300,000 years ago, humankind suddenly popped out of nowhere, right? But then we take people to Stagfontein Caves, and we, we, we lie to them. We say to them, look, this is a cradle of humankind, and we show them Mrs. Pless, and we show them Littlefoot, and they get very excited, but at the same time, they get very confused because these have nothing to do with Homo sapiens. These are little cretins called Australopithecus, and there is no scientific conclusion or consensus that we evolved out of these little cretins. But when they take you to the cradle of humankind, they make you believe that, and they suggest that we evolved out of these cretins. So it's a complete misnomer. It should be called the cradle of hominid kind and not the cradle of humankind. And you'll see very quickly that the cradle of humankind, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> the cradle of humankind is all over in Southern Africa, but has just completely been overlooked and misunderstood. The most ancient written record in human history, as we know, the first civilization, the Sumerians, they wrote and wrote and wrote like they were you know, besieged by the devil. They wrote down everything they could. And when you read the thousands and thousands of pages on Oxford University um, website, they treat every translation, and this is my take on it, go and do your own research. They treat all the translations of the Sumerian tablets as a work of fiction. I'm not kidding you. Just put that into perspective, people. The first people on earth that found the art of writing, the first thing they do is say, so they sit down and they write millions of clay tablets full of crap. How is that possible? You know, do me a favor. I did a lot of work on literacy, teaching children how to read, and I can see at least one person in this auditorium that worked on that project with me. I know what it's like when a Grade one child can hardly read, and they get words wrong, and they get the meanings of words wrong. When I read those translations on Oxford University website, I can see exactly how they're getting things wrong. It's like, re like, like watching grade ones that have just learned how to read, trying to explain big words that they don't understand, get the meanings wrong. It's quite spectacular. Just go and look at, look at that for yourselves. All the greatest stories in the Bible originally come from the Sumerian tablets, every single one of them. The important definitions, the Holy Trinity, first come the, from, comes to us from the Sumerians, Anu, Enlil, and Enki. When the Bible refers of the, to the giants, the Anakim, it's probably, I believe, the same group that the Sumerian tablets refer to, Anunnaki, Anakim, Anunnaki. Elohim, we meet the Elohim, the biblical God, the gods of the Bible. The Elohim is a plural, it's never a singular. So every time you read the word God in the Bible, you've got to replace it with the gods. That's its original meaning. Don't get confused by it. Then we meet Allah, that's a derivative of Elohim, so it's also a plural. Then in Genesis 6, we meet those naughty Nephilim, or the sons of the gods that came down from the heavens and they saw the beautiful daughters of man and they married the, as many as they wanted and had children with them. This is some very interesting stuff that we read in the Bible. That could, never really gets explained until you start understanding the Sumerian translations. But this is all a work of fiction, right? All of the, all of the above is there because of the obsession with gold. <clears throat> the Sumerian tablets, great source of information. On the left, just to show you how some of these cross-reference each other, on the left, these are two examples of uh, several so-called Sumerian kings lists. On the left is this king's list that tells us the names of eight kings who ruled for a period of 212,000 years before the flood. On the right is this Sumerian uh, king's list that tells us the names of about 134 kings or more, because it's, it's damaged, and it tells us the names of at least 10 kings, 10 of those kings that ruled for a period of 224,000 years before the flood. So you've got to ask yourself, there's some interesting corroboration, but it's very important that they both refer to this event called the flood. And pretty much all ancient cultures and civilizations have this flood event in their oral traditions. In the olden times, the gods came to earth and created the earthlings. In the prior times, none of the gods was on earth, nor were the earthlings yet fashioned. In the prior times, the abode of the gods was their own planet. Nibiru is its name. Make of this translation what you want, a work of fiction or real translations, real information. And let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, the hardship work to take over. Let the being the toil of the Anunnaki carry on his back. Once again, make of that what you want. And we get introduced to the Lord Enki, the Sumerian created deity, and we get introduced to his symbol, which today 
as a, those that study medicine will know, is still the, used by the medical fraternity as a symbol of modern medicine, one of the oldest symbols on planet Earth. And that is encoded with so much knowledge and information, we can spend an entire lecture on that alone. The work in the Abzu is very important. Abzu has been given many meanings, but one of the primary meanings in the Sumerian Talbots is that's where the gold came from. So if we can find where the gold came from, then we can reverse engineer it and say, well, this must be the Abzu. And you'll see that the gold came from nowhere else but right here in southern Africa. And it's still coming from here, isn't it? Zulu creation agrees with all the stuff. In fact, all of African mythology, sorry, let me rephrase that. Most of African mythology and most of African historic accounts speak about the same things. The sky gods that came down in Zulu, it's the Abalungu that came down from the sky. They created the people to do what? To mine gold. This is not new to the Zulu knowledge keepers. The Zulu people, people of the sky, that's the meaning, or something along those lines. The Abelungu, the pale sky gods, the same aspects given to the, to the Anunnaki by the Sumerian tablets. And if you think Enki is only a Sumerian entity, no way. In, in Zulu, he's known as Enkai. Suddenly, Sumerian entity becomes a Zulu entity at the same time, and we have a very interesting crossover. And then Solomon is not just a Solomon in the Bible, but in Zulu tradition, he's known as Shalumi, a rich African king that had all the gold mines. And we, start, we have to start questioning, what's going on here? Was Solomon really who we think he was? Or was it actually someone else in another part of the world that was doing all kinds of stuff all over the world? It gets really interesting. And then that elusive word, Abantu. Nobody seems to know what the origin of Abantu is. Well, Kreda Mutwa tells me very bluntly, the word Abantu comes from Abantu, the children of Antu, who was Antu, the Sumerian goddess who loved the Abzu where the gold came from. The children of Antu, Abantu. That's Kreda Mutwa's words. Over 600 African mythologies speak about the same or very similar kind of set of events and the origins of humankind. Our current belief system that Southern Africa was a sparsely populated continent with very few inhabitants about a thousand years ago and very, very few prior to that. Well, fortunately, the ancient stone ruins of Southern Africa tell a completely different tale. And many of these stones that would be called cattle kraal or, uh, you know, just kraal or something to the stone enclosures have, been, have done a great amount of damage because it's been described from a complete position of ignorance because there are many thousands of these. I'll show you just a few of them. First, first thing you realize that all of them are circular. Some of them are complex. Some of them are very simple. And you can see from some of these aerial photographs that we're dealing with huge amounts of sedimentation. And you'll see that each one of them is completely unique. And that little bit of information is crucial to this bit of, to this, uh, to this expose, that each one of these stone circles is completely unique. Some of them have very complex internal structures, some of them have simple internal structures, and then suddenly you start seeing the spider's web effect that comes out of the central circle and many times covers the whole mountain or the whole hill into space with many other things. As you see, more simple structures than very complex structures, and you'll note that they're all connected by these ancient roads or channels there was actually a channel right between there connecting those two. You can't see it anymore. And you realize that we're dealing with something very unusual. Look at that horseshoe shape over there with a perfect circle in the middle. When you're on the ground, you don't realize that that is there. You can only see this from the air. Most of these are f pretty much flat with the ground. See all the stuff around it there? Don't worry about this. That's the obvious stuff. But the stuff around it, that's the stuff that interests me because that's covered by soil. The nice figure of eight there, and a nice horseshoe in the middle of a much larger circle. And we start seeing these amazing anomalies. Look at all the stuff in between, covered by soil. Just because you can see these, don't ignore the stuff that's covered by soil. Look at these beautiful flower kind of shapes. They were making pretty flowers, yay. And all connected by these channels, look at it. This is one of the areas that we scanned with GPR, so I'm really keen to see what comes out of that. And then some of them still got very high walls, very impressive. Important to note, no doors or entrances. And this is one of the first things that in 1939 already archaeologists were, were amazed at. That many of these sites that they go to explore, no doors or entrances. And then these agricultural terraces that run for thousands of kilometers. 
The numbers just don't make sense. This is in a sparsely populated continent, people. There were just like 5,000 people or so. Depend, depends on what information, what books you read. There was nobody living here in those days. These terraces that cover mountain after mountain, thousands and thousands of square kilometers covered by terraces, huge amounts of work. Here you see terraces interspaced by the channels, circles, and then terraces going all the way down to the river, covered by soil. There you can see terraces running up to the top of the mountain. It's a circle with this channel running right into it. But you can't get in. The channels don't allow you to get in. And then, as I said, these ancient roads, that we originally called them roads, but actually channels, with a spider's web effect that runs out from the channel. Look at these roads coming in to all of these channels. It seems like originally all of these stone circles in these huge clustered communities were all connected by the channels or these roads, I now call them channels, and the terraces, all interconnected. Nothing was standing apart. <clears throat> this is a beautiful example. Just because you can't see those ruins there, they're covered by soil. And look at that beautiful cluster of hexagonal cells over there. We'll talk about those tomorrow if we've got time. That is a spectacular discovery. It makes no sense. More channels into circles. This is one of the most spectacular pictures we've got. And imagine most of Southern Africa looking like this a long, long time ago. What you're looking at is the largest and most mysterious ancient stone settlement on earth. Dwellings, workplaces, places of worship that span thousands of years and many, many civilizations that reused and reoccupied these structures. That's why they are so complex and so misunderstood. Ancient roads that link all them. Terraces that cover more than 450,000 square miles or square kilometers. Think about this, people. This is a sparsely populated continent. It makes no sense. What is so special about these ruins? Well, they're obviously very special cattle kraal. And these cattle were very, very, um, very, very special because they d demanded some very special features in, the, in their kraals, like special markers to mark east <clears throat> and, uh, you know, special relationships and sacred geometry in some of these structures. Yeah. And uh, you start realizing this is, mo this is mostly Johann Heiner's work. Johann has spent years and years researching this and plotting these, and it takes a long time to reach these discoveries. So if it wasn't for Johann, we would not know this. And thank God he didn't take the academics seriously when they told him to bugger off, you're wasting our time. And you start realizing these things are encoded with very ancient knowledge of sacred geometry. And you start seeing hexagons, and you realize that this stuff is far more encoded and complex than we ever imagined. Aligned with all kinds of sunrises, solstices, equinoxes, in both directions. Look at that. And to do this, you've got to go up there in all these days and mark the sun. And Johann was very diligent in doing this thing. Goodness for that. These are no accidental structures, very carefully put in place for very specific reasons. And you realize when you extend that little flat area that stems from the northern marker, you get a perfect hexagon inside the circle and a perfect star tetrahedron around the inner circle, and you realize these guys were way ahead of the pack in their knowledge of what they were doing. And you know that they understood all this fundamental structure of matter, sacred geometry, the, the fractal nature of reality, and that's very important here as well. The first references of these stone circles actually go back 500 years ago to the Portuguese, Antonio Fernandes, when he landed on the, Port on the Mozambican coast. There are records in the, in the entries there that he talks about the Karanga people or the Makaranga people. What are the Kalanga or Makaranga people? Children of the sun. Suddenly they encounter sun-worshipping cultures in southern Africa that shouldn't belong here. We're not supposed to have sun-worshipping cultures in southern Africa, and yet we find them all over the place. How many of these ruins were there? And this is my grand finale for today because my time is up. Well, in 1891, the brilliant Theodore Bent from horseback doing exploration in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. This is the inside of Great Zimbabwe. He was the first guy to truly excavate Great Zimbabwe. He talks about an ancient civilization and at least between one and a half and two meters of sediment 
pointing to a gold mining civilization. We'll come back to that tomorrow. He estimated from horseback in 1891 already that there were about 4,000 of these circles. That was brave of him. By 1974, Roger Summers estimated about 20,000 of these. He made a beautiful diagram in one of his books. And at that stage, when I discovered Roger um, Summers' work, I went, 20,000 in a sparsely populated continent. These guys were busy, man. Each one of them built himself like four or five cool, cool ruins, you know. So they truly, really had some special abilities to cart the stones from the rivers up to the tops of the mountains. And um, then I got involved in 2007 after I met Jan Heiner. And within the first year or so, after walking up and down a couple of these mountains, I reached the conclusion there were at least 100,000 of these. I phoned up the ex-head of archaeology, Revel Mason, at Wits University. I got a hold of him on the phone, miraculously, and I said, Revel, how many of these stone circles do you think they are? And off the bat, just like that, he said, oh, at least 100,000. And I, was, I couldn't believe it. I said, that's amazing, Revel, because that's more or less what I think, about 100,000. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, but you know what? This poses a huge problem. And he said, what? I said, well, if we get 100,000 of these and we ascribe even, you know, 10 people to one, each one, we got a huge population problem. We got about a million people living in ancient times in Southern Africa. And there was a little silence, and he said, but then they can't be 100,000. <laughs> that was it. You see? Whoosh, back into dogma. Ignore the evidence. Straight into the dogma box. That's not how we get on. That's not how we do science. We've got to deal with the anomalies, and you're going to see a lot of those anomalies when Klaus Donner presents his work to you later. Um, if we're not brave enough to deal with anomalies, get out of your job, go do something else, become a waiter. You know, don't be an archaeologist. It's not, not meant for you. So I started counting because I was busy finishing temples of the African gods, and I didn't want to suck this information out of my thumb like everybody else seems to have done before me. So I thought, well, let me be more scientific about this. So I got into Google, got into all the aerial shots, and I broke them down into little squares, 100 square meters and 1,000 square meters, a square kilometer. I counted all the average stone circles, and I got an average of those. And I did what you know, I deemed to be scientifically acceptable. And I looked at the areas in South Africa and Zimbabwe and Botswana. I'm just showing you some of these so you can see. Sometimes you can't see them. And what you find very quickly is uh, you start to, once your eyes sensitize, you see them from a mile away. And some of the people that go on tours with me and fly in the helicopters actually get to see it quite quickly. Your eyes do sensitize very quickly. And when you start counting them, this is south of Johannesburg, by the way, just, just south of us here. There are thousands of them around Johannesburg, thousands. Okay? And Melville copies, there's one right there. But we get told that's about 200 years old, right? Sure. <clears throat> There's evidence right next to it that I don't have time to talk about that points to it being, you know, probably way over 200,000 years old. Um, this is south of Johannesburg. This is other side of Rustenburg. Look how dense this is. It's spectacular. This is a huge, huge settlement that could not possibly have been, be, been built by any tribe of any kind in recent southern African history. And then you also start seeing evidence of sedimentation in among these circles. It's important to notice those things, the sedimentation. And these circles and the connecting channels and the terraces go on and on. And I was counting and counting. This is near Leidenberg. It's all over the place. Interesting shapes as well. By the time I finished counting, I counted at least 10 million. And I can tell you right now from the last six months' work, I'm prepared to tell you that there's probably much more than 10 million of these stone circles. And in that second and in that moment, you realize that we must close our history books, throw them away, and start from scratch. That the history of Southern Africa is completely different from anything else we've ever heard. They have not done their history, uh, their research properly. They have published non-scientifically researched information They've been confusing us for a long time, spewing forth the same dogma, probably from a position of ignorance, so we can forgive them for that, but 
The time for forgiveness is now over. Now we need to move into the new area of knowledge and wisdom. Now that you know this, do not be swayed by arguments to the contrary because they all come from a lack of research, a lack of knowledge in this area. And I can speak of experience because I've been there, I've walked these mountains, and I have spoken personally to many, many of these so-called very clever people. And they do not really know what they're talking about. So... What happened to them? You can see huge amounts of sedimentation. What happened to them is what I will tell you tomorrow, <laughs> just before lunch. So hopefully this gives you something to think about. Tomorrow is a real roller coaster ride, and I'll show you some beautiful implements, tools, and artifacts that cannot be disputed, are extremely, extremely old, and probably some of the most important artifacts in all of human history, right here in southern Africa, not in Egypt, not in Peru, not in China or anywhere else, right on our doorstep. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see some of you tomorrow. Thank you.